So hello everyone and welcome to this um, LTC COVID webinar. Today we're going to be uh, so covering Europe and some uh, countries of the of the OECD. We're going to start by taking a look at France. We'll then go to Portugal. We'll also have a presentation from Italy, and then we'll finish uh, have a big overview of uh, the situation in the OECD. So I'm really delighted to get started straight away with a presentation from uh, Leila Rikov from the Ministry of uh, Health in France. And uh, Leila, the floor is yours. You want to get started? You can okay. share your screen. And cool. for everyone else, please remember to mute uh, until you want to speak. Put your questions on the chat box. And uh, we will also be sharing the slides and the recording in about a week from now. So welcome, everyone. And call yours, Leila. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you can you see the slides? Yes, all good, thank you. Okay, I'm Leila Rickross, Administrator in C. I'm working for DRESS, which is a statistic department of the Ministry of Health and Solidarity. I am the head of the Disability and Old Age Dependency Office. I present today an overview of the situation of the French nursing homes in 2020. So there is a specific monitoring survey that has been developed by Santé Publique France for nursing homes from the end of March 2020. Nursing homes start responding when they have a one COVID case and stop at the end of the, active, of the last active COVID case with daily update of case and deaths. A same nursing home can experience several episodes. In order to understand the differences between the episode of COVID, we define here three levels of severity to qualify the episode. An unqualified episode corresponds to the presence of at least one resident possible or confined or confirmed COVID case. An episode is said to be severe when at least a third or 30 residents are affected. An episode is said to be critical when at least 10% or 10 residents affected by COVID have died in the hospital or in the nursing home. So, as you can see in France, the dynamics of the epidemic in, in nursing homes is similar to that observed in the general population with a first peak in March, April, 2020 and a second in October, November, 2020. Mid-March 2020, up to 300 critical episodes start a week, starting a week are observed. At the end of October, 2020, we observe up to 140 critical episodes, uh, which start one week. During the first wave of the epidemic, 47% of nursing homes in France reported at least one infectious episode during which a resident was affected by COVID-19 and 16% experienced a several episode, so more than 30 residents or more than a third resident affected. 10% of nursing homes experience a critical episode in which more than 10 residents or more than 10% of residents died from affection. During the second wave, more nursing homes experience a severe episode, but we observe the same proportion of critical episodes. The second wave affected more nursing homes and caused twice as much contamination of residents than the first wave. However, the number of deaths is the same, a little less of 15,000 elderly. We suppose that it can be linked to better detection of asymptomatic, of asymptomatic case thanks to tests or better care of severe, of severe form of the disease. In total, 38% of all residents were infected and 5% died. Three out of four nursing homes had at least one coronavirus case among the residents in 2020. 
and one third of nursing homes reported several episodes during the year 2020. The first wave of the epidemic has unevenly affected the French territory with very exposed regions like Grand Est or Ile de France. Mechanically, the recirculation of the virus, more important in these territories, resulted in more contamination and more deaths among nursing home residents. 88% of nursing homes in Ile de France had at least one contaminated resident. 45% of nursing homes in Ile-de-France had a critical episode, that is, when at least 10% or 10 residents died. In contrast, regions like Nouvelle-Aquitaine, Occitanie, or Brittany have counted very few affected nursing homes and very few days. Only 1% of nursing homes in Brittany had a critical episode. Nursing homes were a little more affected during the second wave, which touched more regions. Auvergne-Rhône-Alpes and Provence-Alpes-Côte d'Azur as the most affected, with, respected, with respectively 73% and 66% of their nursing homes having experienced an episode during the second wave. Other characteristics than territorial approach can be linked to the circulation of COVID-19 in nursing homes. By controlling, by controlling the intrinsic characteristics of nursing homes, as well as their location, some differences appear significant. We observe, of course, a strong territorial effect, also a strong effect of the number of beds, and we, so we also see a difference uh, of status. The effect of legal status on nursing homes are also more marked during the second wave than during the first wave. Private for profit nursing homes were significantly more affected than other structures at equal characteristic and location. It could be a consequence of a lower supervision rate and the greater use of subcontracting in private nursing home, which can lead to more of staff mixing. This hypothesis, however, uh, is to be, remains to be proved. Furthermore, as for the first wave, the public within hospital nursing home have also been less exposed to the virus than the other. The public within hospital nursing home by their proximity to the health environment, may have personnel who, who are more aware of hygiene and asepsis than other structures. And we find no effect of residents' average health status nor care needs. Vaccination of nursing home residents began at the end of the year 2020. At the end of February 2021, four out of five residents received a first dose and one in two received the both doses. We observe a decrease in the epidemic within nursing homes in 2021. There is no third wave as in the general population. For example, between March 2021 and May, 13% of nursing homes declare a new episode of infection among the residents and we have only six residents who died from COVID. It is seven times less than during the months of January and February 2021. We observe almost no more critic episodes since March, only eight episodes. We will publish more results on COVID-19 vaccination effect at the, year, at the end of this year. This study has already been published, but in French. Uh, you can find here the links. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Leila. That's uh, very interesting to see and also interesting to think about some of these findings on the status of nursing homes, the legal status, and how that seems to be coming up 
in lots of different countries. So we're next going to hear from Oscar Brito Fernandez, who's going to present uh, some data from Portugal. Oscar, all yours. Uh, Leila, if you want to stop sharing. Okay, sorry. And then, uh, Oscar will share. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I was just uh, uh, welcoming everyone to, to this webinar and thank you, Adelina, for inviting me. Uh, it's very important for us to share the results of this uh, uh, initial study that we conducted here in Portugal in the early phases of the pandemic. So this, uh, I'll be reporting on results um, on a survey that we conducted in March, July 2020, uh, and only in the southern part of, of Portugal. Just to bring some context, my name is uh, Oscar Brito Fernandes. I'm currently based in Portugal. I'm Portuguese, but I'm part of a larger network, which is called Health Pros, which is an international innovative training network uh, that is looking at performance intelligence and how to make best and effective use of data. Uh, we are 14 fellows spread across Europe. Uh, it's a project that is being coordinated by uh, Amsterdam University Medical Centers. And we are pretty much at the end of our uh, project. So um, I invite you to go to our website, healthpros slash h2020.au to uh, see all the outputs that we've been uh, writing. Uh, just to, to kick the, the presentation, just to provide the uh, overview of the organizational uh, structure of nursing homes in Portugal. It has uh, uh, both the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Labor, Solidarity and Social Security, they have oversight roles uh, to, to social care. Uh, Ministry of Health, they are more concerned with all health related uh, components of the social care and the Ministry uh, of Labor, more particularly the Institute of Social Security is focusing more on uh, care homes or residential homes. Uh, the terminology really varies a lot. Um, so, of course, this uh, provides uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, interest in terms of who's running what and who's overseeing what. And, of course, the social care, uh, we have been facing long-lasting challenges since the fragmentation of governance mechanisms, uh, the financing uh, mechanisms, they are not clear as well. Uh, we are not paying, uh, for example, um, for the care that is uh, provided by informal carers, uh, and we still rely heavily on that. Um, the coverage of long-term care, we have a lot of asymmetries throughout the territory. Uh, we still rely a lot in out-of-pocket contributions. For example, uh, in order to have a resident in a nursing home, a family has to spend around uh, 2,000 euros per month, which if you consider the average salary in Portugal, that is quite uh, uh, difficult to to, 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 to do. Also, there's a limit scope and uh, a reach of how health and social care really uh, integrate uh, each other. There are overlapping mechanisms for needs assessment. Um, and we rely a lot on institutionalization rather than focusing on providing uh, care at home and only institutionalize uh, residents when it's actually needed. And of course, all this on top of a poor uh, information system and a lack of interoper interoperability uh, puts um, a lot of challenges that we still face. Uh, just to, to uh, um, focus on the project that we developed in, in the south of Portugal. So I travel, I was in Amsterdam at the time when the, 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 the pandemic really started. Uh, and I was still in Amsterdam in March. Um, and by that time, we, we still didn't know what we were going to face. And I traveled back to Portugal and started to realize that things were, were getting a bit crazy. In Portugal, uh, I, I was, of course, isolating myself, uh, following all the uh, recommendations. I was staying home, working from home. But I, was, I needed to, to do something for the community, uh, put my knowledge into action. So the Algarve Biomedical Center, which is a research center um, from the University of Algarve, they uh, were commissioned by the Ministry of Labor uh, to really address the, the testing difficulties that we are facing at the time. So with the laboratory, they really set up uh, a testing initiative and focusing on nursing homes at first. We had drive-through for the general population and uh, the laboratory were doing all the testing. 
And all of a sudden, a team was uh, uh, set up. Uh, we called the project COVID-70+. Uh, and, and we were focusing on uh, nursing homes on the brown part in southern Portugal. So basically what we were doing, we were doing uh, collecting all information of people, both staff and, and residents that had to be tested. Uh, but just the testing component seemed insufficient to address all uh, the confusion, all the, the, the questions that staff had at that time. So we needed a, a, a broader intervention. That's when we decided that we had to have a more comprehensive approach. And that's when we set up, okay, we need to, to be communicating uh, closely to, to, to nursing homes in order to um, assist them in any way that we could at the time and with the resources that we had available. And uh, one of the, the initiatives that we did was uh, develop this study where we tried to um, assess COVID-19 preparedness of nursing homes uh, in the two regions in Portugal. Uh, we tried to understand the safety concerns and the well-being of staff because we were receiving a lot of complaints and uh, uh, of staff that they were not being able to, to, to go to work or they were not being able to cope with all the situations that were, they were facing inside the, the institutions. And also we wanted to understand their work experiences during the pandemic, including resident safety culture, which in Portugal was never measured. Just this is a, a, um, a overarching view of the, the study design. So we had the testing initiative. So we had the database from the Ministry of Labor. Um, we contacted all nursing homes and we planned the, the, all the testing uh, initiative. So in total, a lot of people were uh, tested. And the study itself, which is uh, uh, in this yellow shaded part. So we had the COVID-19 preparedness. Nursing home managers were the one filling that, that checklist. It was based on the in instrument um, set forward by the CDC. Of course, that we had to do some cultural and contextual adaptations to reflect both the guidelines and orientation of the Directorate, Directorate General of Health uh, here in Portugal, but other uh, uh, authorities in Portugal. And the focus was on the, the structures that were in place and what sort of teams were involved in decision making and in planning to, to, in order to address all the challenges imposed by COVID. And of course, we, we also looked at various elements of a contingency plan and tried to see how nursing homes were addressing those. We had a follow-up call because not all nursing homes um, sent their replies back to us. So we had the second stage of engagement where we called all nursing homes trying to understand how they were doing and if they had uh, submitted previously a checklist, we would of course do a walkthrough discussion of the, the, the submission or we would then uh, ad hoc try to do a brief uh, discussion on the topics covered uh, by the checklist. And later, after all a uh, first round of uh, COVID testing for each uh, facility, we then conducted a, a, a survey to all the staff. It's a safety concerns and well-being um, survey, and it, it it was run in Algarve from May to June and in Alentejo June to July. And it basically we act to act fast, and we didn't have that much time to come up with uh, fancy uh, instruments and surveys. So we had to rely on instruments that were already validated in the Portuguese language. Um, that's why we used the Nursing Home Survey on Patient Safety Culture, WHO Five uh, Wellbeing Index, and other um, indicators. And we also try to understand from the viewpoint of staff what, in which areas they needed support from others the most. Uh, so we could have that information and try to come up with initiatives that uh, would um, try to solve them. Uh, at that time, we, um, for example, on the last day of admission to the survey uh, in the Algarve, there was already a nine increase percent of positive cases uh, from the start of the survey till the last day the survey was, uh, was on and a 33% of increase in cases in Alentejo. So um, this had in, an influence, of course, in how staff were perceiving. Overall, uh, our results show that there was a generalized COVID-19 unpreparedness across all nursing homes. 
And as you can see, um, 25% uh, of nursing homes, they didn't have a proper structure for planning or decision-making in regard how to, uh, to address uh, COVID-19 challenges. And the areas of a contingency plan where nursing homes were uh, um, lacking the most or they were not completely addressing was, were in regard of outbreak capacity. So uh, uh, in total, 41% uh, of nursing homes had in full complied with all the listed uh, items uh, regarding outbreak capacity. And also education and training was an area where uh, investment uh, was identified as deemed needed. Uh, overall, um, we've uh, seen that there, are, um, there were a lot of poor communication channels, both internal inside nursing homes, but also externally with competent uh, authorities. Um, insufficient planning to overcome industries related with chefs, staff shortages, absenteeism, uh, and also other infrastructure constraints in regard, for example, not having sufficient uh, number of rooms to, to make sure of all the distancing um, uh, between residents. And we've seen a lot of uh, uh, signaling in regard to the misuse of personal protective equipment, partly attribute to poor training and a generalized shortage at that time of specific training. But we've seen a lot of good practices as well. There were some uh, nursing homes that they revised continuously their, their contingency plans. Uh, they had pro emergency protocols set up with primary healthcare centers uh, nearby, just in case of an outbreak. Uh, and they were using as, as well social media to uh, communicate with families uh, because at the time um, visiting was not allowed in nursing homes. And you can see that um, even though that our survey participants, they recognized that the, stat, the testing initiative uh, in nursing homes was uh, important, that had little effect on their perception of becoming infected. And that perception was quite large, but uh, uh, to a lesser extent, the, the perception of becoming severely ill was uh, less expressive than the perception of becoming infected. Um, and we also saw in our, in our data that uh, the staff perceived, perceived and experienced fear and absenteeism among peers uh, very differently. Um, and we had six clear uh, clusters in regard to those two uh, features, but uh, trying to characterize each of those clusters was very complicated because they were homogeneous. Uh, even so, we tried to, to to provide some, some uh, information on those. And for example, people that were uh, less, uh, perceived less fear were those that, or either they didn't have uh, any children or they didn't result, uh, they were not living with uh, older people or they had a lower perception of becoming infected. Um, so it was really difficult to try to characterize each of these clusters, but uh, they are very different from one another. The other thing that we wanted to highlight is the resident safety culture uh, from the staff's perspective. And many areas were signaled as needing improvement, particularly the ones regarding compliance with procedures and education and training and non-punitive uh, response to mistakes, which are all areas of improvement. I'm very happy to say that all of this was not uh, in vain and it had actually an effect. So preliminary results of this study uh, led to new tools that are now available nationwide. Um, nationwide, I mean, it's not only for the southern parts of Portugal, it's, it's real to all Portugal, to, to all nursing homes. So a, a national supporting line was set up. Uh, it's available 24-7 uh, since October 2020. And basically, it tries to streamline the communication between nursing homes and, uh, and authorities, but also try to address uh, any issues regarding training because we have a training program that is uh, set up uh, to run nationally as well. Um, and it, it has been really important to avoid uh, uh, outbreaks. And most recently, it was just launched to the life uh, 5th, uh, a new platform which aims to facilitate recording of uh, and the monitoring of uh, oxygen saturation levels, temperature, basically trying to assist and provide a, a, a new tool to support staff decision-making in regard to symptoms associated uh, with uh, respiratory conditions. So, um, and we are still, of course, 
uh, going through uh, uh, continuously going through uh, our data to try to come up with uh, new initiatives that are um, of value to nursing homes. This all, of course, just to remind that we still have major gaps to address after many decades of disinvestment, such as a, a bad integration and coordination between health and social care, uh, a link uh, uh, to the best we can, uh, all regional and local initiatives with the, the, the current healthy and active aging agenda that we have in going Portugal, come up with new financial mechanisms to pay for uh, long-term care providers, revise the work skill sets, levels and training and pay uh, um, accordingly to, to all the staff that is providing uh, their work and their knowledge in nursing homes. And of course, develop quality standards, which should underpin safety culture and greater care experience to all residents and establish robust performance intelligence so we could actually monitor uh, the progress we are making and have a people-centered care approach which we are still lacking in social care and one of one of the suggestions is why don't we transpose the value agenda that we have in healthcare to long-term care where we could uh, uh, strengthen um, value in uh, uh, all these facilities and this is just a snapshot in in the early uh, last year and we of our team uh, and we are set up in a stadium. It's quite a large team. We were even retreated by Mariah Carey, which was very important for us at the time. We were all quite exhausted along 20 hours per day, and that really made our day that day. And I invite you to uh, get access to the preprint uh, using the QR code, and I welcome your questions later on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, very impressive effort and amazing impact. Oscar, I was wondering if you could also put the direct link to the paper on the chat, uh, just in case people are not able to find the- Oh yeah, thank you so very much, Adelina, yeah. The, yes. So um, now we're going to head to Italy and that was actually a very good introduction to the next paper because it's going to, we're going to be hearing from Elisabetta Notar Nicola from uh, Bocconi University on the reforms that are being considered in Italy in response to the COVID pandemic. So Elisabetta, all yours, if you'd like to share the screen. Thank you, Adelina. We'll share it in a second. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Give me one. Yes. Okay, now it should be there. All good? Yes, we can see the screen if you want to press yes, the... Yes. yes, perfect. Okay. Thank like you. This. Okay, so uh, as it, uh, Adelina introduced, I would like to, um, well, first give you some numbers about Italy, not that much number because I think that uh, since we have been, we had the first, the, the first wave also in nursing homes, some numbers about Italy have already been circulating. So I would like to give you some updates on what is happening right now and then to discuss what we are observing in terms of the point of view of the care provider and what's next in terms of reforms. So for what concerns the second way in, in Italy, I present here the figures coming from Istituto Superiore di Sanità that uh, publish a super updated report. Uh, the, the update is at, as at the 13th of June, 2020. Uh, with the updates on the new cases. So in this um, uh, graphic, it, it's in Italian, but I will uh, can translate for you. So you see three lines. Uh, the red one uh, is um, the, the figure of the new cases in the overall population. Of course, you have the weeks and then the percentage of the, um, the new cases in the population. So the red one is the overall population. Then you have the, the blue one is nursing homes. And then the, well, let's say green or brown is overall residential care, not only uh, elderly uh, not, um, nursing homes, but for example, also disabled care and, and similar. So you can see that in, well, from the beginning of 2021, and then uh, March, uh, you have like what we call the, the, the fourth wave in the overall, overall population, but it was completely different for what concerned nursing homes and other residential care facilities. And then the decreasing of the new cases in nursing homes and other residential care facilities just continue until June. Uh, overall population, um, happily, we had a new decrease from April and onward 
but uh, this figure is connected with uh, what we uh, have also here um, in this other graphic where we have only the um, facilities, um, the, the nursing homes, again, the blue one, and then the brown green one is the um, overall the, the residential facilities for people in social care, uh, explaining when the vaccination campaign begin, that is at the end of December 2020. In this very moment, the percentage of uh, elderly living in nursing home that have received the, 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 the full cycle of vaccination is close to 94%. So the vaccination campaign is almost finished. And these numbers that you can see here, the, the drop in the new cases is just the demonstration that the vaccination campaign was, uh, was good, it was fast. Uh, at least in nursing homes differently. It, it went very differently for the overall population. It is still going very differently for the overall population, uh, but at least for nursing homes, it works. And now we have really, the new cases are just the exception. Uh, these other, this second graph is the percentage of nursing home that presents a new case in the week. Okay, this is just to give you an update about where we are in terms of uh, new cases and the, the spread of COVID-19 among nursing homes and the elderly population. Then I would like to introduce the, the point of view of care providers because um, from Portugal and France, we have seen some very interesting um, uh, surveys that have been conducted in nursing homes explaining how the spread of COVID-19 happened. Also very interesting the figure concerning the, um, the nature of the nursing homes in relation to the the spread of the disease, but um, with Bocconi University, also us, we have done a survey with 20 uh, care providers. It seemed a very small number, but these 20 care providers represent the 11% of the nursing homes in Italy. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have been doing some qualitative work for the moment, very preliminary work. So it was a survey then uh, followed um, by a focus group. And now we are preparing a more quantitative um, survey to be spread to the um, to all nursing homes in Italy. The objective of the survey was first to ask them now in 2020, which are the criticalities that from their point of view still persist in the long-term care sector or nursing home sector uh, as a consequence of 2020, as a consequence of COVID-19. So here, since it is very preliminary work, I have only um, I only present the list of the items that they have been highlighting in terms of which are the criticalities that still persist. So after more than one year of COVID-19, the first priority for care provider in Italy is still reaching break even in terms of economic and financial sustainability. So 2020 uh, as a fiscal year was closed with a lot of bankruptcy and very negative performance in terms of um, economic performance of uh, nursing homes. Uh, if we see these as care providers and as um, economic actors operating in, in a sector. So for them, uh, still the priority now is to recover from uh, what happened in 2020 and trying to reach the break even is something that is still very hard. The costs have been increasing in 2020 and revenues have been decreasing both from public welfare and from private out of pocket uh, interventions. So still this is the first priority. Then priority number two is uh, related to the care professionals. Uh, it, uh, also in this case in 2020, a managing care professional was uh, pretty hard, both in terms of new competencies that uh, were needed, but mainly in terms of availability of care professionals, because we have, as other European countries, we have been witnessing uh, shortages of care professional in nursing homes. Uh, the estimation is of a 20% of um, absence of um, falling out of care professional being present in nursing homes and wor working in nursing homes. What happened was that many of them just abandoned their places of work, deciding and no more to operate in nursing homes during the pandemic. And this was due to some psychological pressures and the fear of the pandemic. And the other effect was, um, was, was the big 
uh, say, uh, attraction power than traditional healthcare sectors, such as public hospital and sim similar operated uh, toward care professional, because uh, during 2020, public uh, healthcare sector has been hiring, especially nurses, uh, so to increase the number of professionals, so to be able to cope with the pandemic and the uh, working condition in the public healthcare sector are um, extremely better than the one that are provided in the long-term care nursing uh, home, uh, nursing home sector in terms both of um, typology of contracts, um, quality of work, and also wages. So we have been witnessing in specifically in some region in Italy, let's say that thousands of nurses and other care professionals just opting for leaving nursing homes so to being hired uh, by the public healthcare sector. So still in 2020, uh, the shortages of care professional is a priority and together with, as I mentioned before, with, um, with the update of the competencies that are needed now so to uh, face a new situation and elderly living in nursing homes that have now different healthcare conditions than in the past and also uh, different procedures that are needed in nursing homes. Then the, the following priorities are connected one with the other. So the um, coping with the new administrative burden uh, connected with information collection, uh, that is something um, that is a consequence of COVID-19. Um, well, Italy was the first uh, being hit by COVID-19, but maybe was also the first country in Europe when were the numbers of deaths in nursing homes just uh, reached the, the public debate and the public opinion. So last April, we had really a uh, strong newspaper campaign against this uh, these sector. And still we are paying the consequence in terms of the fact that after that, um, some new administrative uh, requirements and some new information requests have been introduced. So to increase the level of control of uh, public authorities on what is happening in, uh, in nursing homes and how they, they are managed, not only in, um, for what concerns COVID-19 procedure, but in general, quality of care. So that the number of control um, concerning quality of care really increase, and this uh, puts some pressure in terms of administrative burdens on, on the care providers. Uh, then uh, the other priority, um, the other critical, sorry, not priorities to be faced still are the new admission. Uh, still new admission are following some requirements that have been updated from the past. So to have new admission in nursing homes, many requirements in terms of COVID-19 quarantine and testing need to be followed and, and also new requirements in terms of the profile of the elderly that can be admitted now in nursing homes. Uh, so on one end, it is harder to to, to, to follow the, the curve pathway and to be coherent with these new requirements. So to be able to offer something in nursing homes that is coherent with the new profile that have been identified as possible for new admission. And on the other, these new admission um, are connected with um, criticalities number one, reaching break even because uh, new admission have been reducing in this month if compared to, for example, 2019 or 2018. So the, um, the, the rate of the occupancy rate of the beds in nursing homes still is low and is very far from the break even and also new technologies. With this, we refer to all the new technologies that have been um, introduced during the pandemic, for example, so to guarantee communication and new tool for supervision and monitoring of the elderly. And still, it is hard for the care provider to cope with these new technologies, even after one year. Uh, the last criticality is managing PP PPE acquisition and the overall procedure of COVID-19. So we can say that after one year, these are no more criticalities because at the end, PPE are now available and also the procedure are now well established and easier to be followed. Um, always from this preliminary work with the care providers, we have been able to detect um, this list of eight challenges for the future for LTC sector in Italy. 
that uh, well, we, we have derived, um, we as research group, we have derived from the, um, all the analysis that we have been performing in 2020. And now we have um, tested also this list of challenges with two focus group and some group of care providers. So now we can say that also, uh, as I've written here, they have approved this list. In, um, and I mean with that, that also they recognize the fact that these are the challenges for the future. So bottom up, in the perspective of the care provider, the, the challenges are, are this one, and these are really connected with the criticality that I've just uh, mentioned. So for sure, the economic sustainability of, of the system, uh, not only the single provider, but also the, um, the sustainability of the system is under discussion now. Uh, and then a discussion is undergoing concerning uh, which should be the mission of the long-term care sector and services. So which should be the focus uh, dependent elderly, more autonomous elderly, more residential care, more home care. So which would be the future, which are the services that we need the most. And also number four and five, how we have to put together long-term care services and different settings. So the title of this uh, PowerPoint is From Abandoned Castle to What? There is a very important and, and famous article that uh, was public in The Lancet during COVID-19 where Italian nursing home have been um, fine at abandoned castle uh, since during the pandemic it emerged uh, in a strong way how uh, long-term care sector in general and nursing homes specifically have been abandoned in, in the very last year by the public debate and by public intervention and public policies. So no new investments uh, arrived before COVID-19 and no new regulation. The, um, the sector was stagnating before COVID-19 and now after COVID-19 and after all the uh, after everything that happened, we have these big possibilities of um, uh, stepping into the debate so to be able to promote some changes so that's why I've used these uh, images of the abandoned castle and the future of this abandoned castle what will be. Other challenges that have been mentioned are related um, to the private and public mm, sector relationship so uh, private sector pri uh, in, in, in long-term care in Italy is really underdeveloped. So the number of beds and services available out of pocket or private market is, is really low compared to other countries. So um, after COVID, we really perceive that this, is, can, that this can be um, something that can support the sustainability of the future of the long-term care system. And then, the, uh, well, HR, of course, I've already mentioned what we are facing in terms of professional, but I know that this is a, um, an issue also at the European level. And last, uh, the, the absence of adequate IT system and information system to represent long-term care and nursing home care sector in Italy, something that should be, um, well, that it should be, um, in, should need some investment on because uh, during COVID-19, we really have been suffering from the absence of information and only after some new initiative has been uh, implemented. What is happening for the moment? And I am going to close in, in two minutes. Well, for the moment at the national level, uh, by the end of 2020, three different commissions have been uh, established, a commission that have been entitled an address to the few to discussing the future of long-term care and nursing homes the point is that this commission for the moment have uh, have produced almost nothing uh, and um, experts have been only poorly uh, involved in this so we have politicians there we have charities we have geriatricians but no care providers included and and no uh, elderly association. So the perspective of the, the care services here in this commission is, is, is poor. Uh, we have three different commission. One established at the parliament level, specifically dedicated to investigated what happened during COVID-19 in terms of also responsibility for the death. 
that happen in nursing homes. Then we have um, another one promoted by the Ministry of Health that is known as Commissione Monsignor Paglia, following the name of the, um, the, the person that is in charge of guiding this commission. And here the topic is uh, the future of nursing homes. And then we have a fourth one promoted by the National Agency for Excellence in Healthcare Services that also is an agency of the Ministry of Health. And here the topic of this specialized commission is more broadly the, the future of long-term care, not only nursing homes, but more broadly the future of long-term care. But as I already said, for the moment after more than six months of operation, no news is, is coming from this commission. Then we have a lot um, attention on what is called PNRR in Italy, that is the National Recovery Plan for Resilience, that is the national plan uh, for implementing the, the European recovery plan. And here all the Italian strategies have been declared and we, mm, well, care providers and long-term care providers are looking at this uh, plan with a lot of attention because uh, there is the mention of new possible investments in home care and in community care with also the indication of new community care center to be established where also long-term care should have a place. Uh, but then uh, in this plan, there is no specific mention to elderly people and the aging phenomena and long-term care more in general, apart from these community care centers. So no idea of, of how to put together the other intervention of this national recovery plan, resilience with what we need to change with respect to aging and long-term care more in general. So we have a great expectation on this because all the European funding is going through uh, the action that have been um, identified in this plan, but for the moment, um, no, no indication on how these activities will be implemented uh, is available. So great expectation, but, um, but, but for the moment, <laughs> uh, it, it is only an expectation and nothing more than this. So thank you. Thank you very much. And Elisabetta uh, needs to go because <laughs> I think she's teaching uh, in 15 mm -hmm. minutes. But uh, if the, anybody's got any questions for her, um, you have a chance now. So is there any question specific for Elisabetta? Does anyone would like to raise? If not, Elisabetta, if uh, anybody put anything in the chat, then I can also uh, send it to you. Yeah, later. thank you, Delia. Yeah. I will try to stay as long as I can. <laughs> Thank you. I could take Great. the floor and ask Elizabeth a question go. straight away. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Oscar. You're <laughs> welcome. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, I, I saw on your slide that the vaccination is really working in nursing homes, and we are seeing the same in Portugal, where mm -hmm. the, the, the death numbers, they really uh, are practically none uh, after vaccination. But what we are seeing as well is a lot of resistance from uh, staff in getting vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are discussing at the moment, well, France already uh, took front line in terms of it's mandatory for these professionals to get the vaccine in order to, to go to work. Uh, and we are uh, in the moment in the political debate discussing that if it, we should make the vaccine mandatory or not. What, what sort of uh, discussions are you facing in uh, Italy at the moment regarding this? Mm -hmm. Yes, while you were speaking, I'm opening the report by Instituto Superiore di Sanità to see which is the percentage of the vaccination in the care staff because we have this. So while I try to answer, I will give you also the figure. So for the moment, no obligation have been introduced. Uh, and these, uh, turn into some negative episodes because we have been recording some situation in which we had nursing home where then new uh, cases emerge due to the fact that some of the care personnel was not vaccinated and then was uh, contagious for the elderly in there. So for the moment is not a requirement. Um, I think that the, the rate is, is lower than the one for the elderly, so for the elderly is 94%, uh, okay, I will look for the number, I write this in the chat, so that now I can, <laughs> I can speak, uh, what uh, we, I mean, what in the sector they are trying to do is to work on the professional culture, so in this survey and work with the care provider I'm doing, it really strike me that all of these big care providers, because these are the, the bigger in Italy, also operating internationally, some of 
them in France, Belgium, Germany, and England. They are working on um, on 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 initiatives so to promote a new organizational culture, so to pro to give them some incentive to give care uh, professional incentive, not only to get vaccinated, but to change their attitude toward care work, toward care works and their attitude toward prevention more in general. So no institutional activities, but bottom up, we are witnessing some attempt from who is managing nursing homes so to deal with this. I will look for the number of how many care workers have been vaccinated by now and write the number in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. And just to say that we'll be every now and then in LTC COVID, we produce these summaries or snapshots of the situation. And we're thinking of doing an updated one on the discussions of vaccination, of measures to incentivate uh, vaccination among staff. So now we're going to hand over to Paola. Thanks for your patience. Uh, but I know Elisabeth needs to go probably. So, so it was worth uh, trying to get that question in. Uh, so, Paola, we're now going to hear from the overall OECD, so quite a lot to cover. Thank you very much, all yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, absolutely, I was very interested also in the answer to, to the question. Um, let me just share my screen. I should be able to see. Okay. Um, so yes, thanks for inviting me and also thanks for the previous presenter, to the previous presenters. It was truly interesting to hear your insights on the country perspective. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, I will give more on a, of an overview of our OECD countries. My name is Paula Silvitti and I work in the, in the health division at the OECD. And over the last year uh, with my team, we have been working on a project on um, uh, the analysis of uh, the impact of COVID-19 crisis on the long-term care sector. Uh, the project, um, the paper has not been published yet, will be published in uh, around October, November later this year, October, November 2021. Um, but yeah, we want to give you some uh, preliminary information about the work we have done. Just to give you an idea, I will talk you through the factors of uh, vulnerability of the long-term care sector over OECD countries, so pre-existing challenges. Uh, but I will also introduce some, uh, what were the top challenges that OECD countries faced during the crisis and what have been the, um, the most common policy responses and the best practices. And then I will try to draw some conclusions on uh, areas of uh, further improvement and the day forward and the way forward. Um, starting from the very beginning, from the factors of uh, vulnerability, uh, we all know that the long-term care sector has been uh, heavily impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. In particular, in OECD countries, an average of 40% of COVID-19 uh, deaths has been along the, among the long-term care sector. Um, there has been also quite a big country variation, but it's always uh, um, the, the, the country comparison always required caution in, uh, in these cases because the data and, and the methodology to calculate the COVID-19 deaths can vary among countries, across countries. Of course, the, um, the age, the old age of people receiving long-term care, as well as their precarious health status, has a big impact on the, on the way how the, the long-term care was impacted and reacted to the, to the crisis. But there are also some other pre-existing challenges. Um, yes, the OECD has been working on, uh, on, these, uh, on these topics already for uh, quite, uh, quite some time. And we, we know that the, the working conditions in uh, long-term care are particularly poor with a low tenure rate and like part high part-time rates, part-time employment rates. But also low pay, as it was already mentioned previously, then even compare in even comparable jobs in a hospital tend to pay higher rates compared to our wages compared to the long term care sector. Uh, there has also been some chronic underinvestments over the years, as well as insufficient standards and monitoring and insufficient coordination with the, with the rest of the health system. Uh, and another factor that has played a role. Um, during the, the crisis has been the, um, that emergency preparedness in uh, OECD countries often overlooked the long-term care sector before 2020. Um, over the time, even countries that um, uh, since the beginning of uh, the 2000, early 2000s had already some uh, uh, emergency preparedness systems uh, were often overlooking the, the long-term care sector. But this situation um, experienced a, a turnaround and the, the um, guidelines on infection control in long-term long care have stepped up 
uh, moving from a, a 53 percent in OECD countries before um, the pandemic to 84 percent of countries having infection control in long term care. Um, another important point in uh, emergency preparedness is the, um, the existence of task forces, so uh, groups of experts that can be either at the national, local or uh, facility level that work to coordinate the response to COVID-19 or to other emergen emergencies. In OECD countries, there are still 20% of countries that did not include any long-term care experts in their, um, in their um, task forces. Uh, so, of course, um, the emergency preparedness played uh, a role in uh, the way how countries reacted to the crisis, but it's also true uh, that countries that appeared best prepared for a, a pandemic did not necessarily perform better than others, because, of course, there are many factors that we have to take into consideration. Different countries were um, affected with different timing and reacted in different ways. Um, I will now move to the top challenges and the main policy responses in uh, OECD countries. Uh, the very top challenge at the beginning of the pandemic was uh, the lack of PPE and testing capacity. Uh, in a ranking from, from one as not an issue to five as extremely challenging, uh, OECD countries defined on average the access to PPE as a three and the access to testing as a four. And you can also see from, uh, from the figure in the slide uh, that still in uh, during the summer 2020, so June uh, between June and August 2020, 70, 76% of people caring for long-term care recipients at home did not wear uh, uh, masks or gloves or PPEs in general. Uh, of course, there have been some best performing uh, countries, as you can see on the right of the graph, but the average is still uh, at 76%. Um, the same, a similar issue has been uh, there with testing, with uh, um, not enough testing available to do a, a, a serious contract tracing inside the facilities. So often, um, asym asymptomatic cases were not um, uh, not uh, um, di didn't come up uh, in time to be to stop the spread. Um, and the measures that countries applied to face these issues, we can see on the left. Uh, measures to, um, to face the shortage of uh, PPEs. So countries improved uh, the guidelines, uh, but also created some stockpiles to avoid further uh, shortages. And there was also additional funding for uh, uh, the provision of PPE. An example has been uh, in one region uh, in Italy, the Trentino Alto Adige, where there was actually um, a specific channel of provision created uh, to provide uh, to um, long-term care facilities all the PPE and testing needed. But also Korea created stockpiles and an IT system to manage the provision of, uh, uh, of uh, PPE and testing to long-term care facilities. On the other side, for what concerns testing, we had uh, around 13 countries providing training on, uh, on testing and um, 11 countries providing um, setting up mobile teams inside the long-term care facilities in order to provide testing inside the facility. And then countries also implemented additional funding to, um, to provide testing. Another big issue has been the, the staffing levels, uh, as already mentioned uh, during the previous presentations. On the one side, we can see how the long-term care workers were at higher risk of being infected compared to other workers. In some studies from uh, Portugal, one third of uh, all uh, COVID-19 related sick leaves uh, has been around uh, um, uh, about people working in the long-term care sector. On the other side, uh, facilities with lower number of long-term care workers were associated with higher infection rates. So we see how important the, the um, staff shortages have been in, uh, in the pandemic, um, in the crisis. Uh, there have been two sets of measures to address the staff shortages. On the one side, the recruitment of additional staff. Um, on the other side, the improvement in working conditions. I will not go into detail here, but if you have any question, uh, we can discuss further later on. Um, for what concerns another, another uh, a point of uh, criticality in, uh, in long-term care is the community, the community living. So it was particularly difficult for countries to find the right balance between reducing, restricting uh, visits and uh, implementing isolation inside long-term care facilities. 
and at the same time in, uh, maintain a good level of of um, uh, res resident residents uh, well being mental well being despite their isolation. Um, again, a set of measures have been applied for um, to address this issue, but they've also been changing over the time, adapting to to the to the waves in the pandemic. Um, the issue of care integration in long-term care has been a long-lasting issue, um, both for work concerns integration with private uh, with um, primary care providers and with hospitals. This has been improved during the during the pandemic. Uh, but still further can be can be done. And one big role has been played by the, um, the use of uh, digital technology to improve uh, integration, as well as to improve uh, communication with external, uh, external um, uh, visitors that could not enter the access to facilities. So a big role was played by telehealth in, uh, in, all, uh, in nearly all OECD countries. Um, to moving towards the end of my presentation, we already have some, uh, of course, initial findings of a positive, positive impact of vaccination. All OECD countries started vaccinating um, between the end of uh, 2020 and the beginning of 2021. And uh, the long term care sector was often um, uh, prioritized. So you can see in the graph, uh, but we also have similar uh, results from other countries. And we have also seen uh, data from France how the death rate for uh, England and Wales has been decreasing more sharply in the age group of uh, older, um, older people, aged 65 or, or, or older, compared to younger population. And this is particularly striking if you consider that the, the line um, of the 65 plus is reported on, on the secondary axis. If this wasn't the case, we would see even a more striking um, uh, drop, of course. Um, I will move to some conclusions. Uh, we have highlighted some areas of improvement and some uh, measures that should be um, put in place to, to move forward after the crisis. Uh, definitely the data um, are a, a big issue in long-term care. It's, uh, we, it's, uh, there is the need to ensure the standardized, comprehensive and timely data collection is in place. And that is also in use both in the policy making process, but also for the performance monitoring. Better mo monitoring of uh, the sector's performance is needed to ensure that it is, it is ready for a next crisis. Um, well, workforce condition, as, as already mentioned, you need uh, further improvement with uh, um, uh, staff ratios and skills mismatch that need to be addressed. Uh, infection control has also been a long lasting uh, issue in long term care uh, facilities and it needs to be further addressed, but also home care uh, can be a good way to 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 align uh, care uh, care provision with the needs and the, um, the desires of people receiving care, usually older people would, would like to stay at home for longer in their life and this could be a good way to do so to um, but also to to reduce the the transmission of uh, possible infections uh, but this requires a better long term care uh, um, workers condition and adequate protection with uh, personal protective equipment i will uh, close my presentation just by saying uh, that we the OECD has worked on uh, our long term care topics um, already and is uh, we'll keep working on, uh, on these topics, so you can visit our website if you want to see uh, more about our work, or you can follow us on Twitter. And I also left, us my, left here the email, my email, as well as my team's email, if you want to have more uh, updates on the project or uh, further questions later on. So I thank you all, and I give you back the, the floor. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Paula. And I think uh, we're all going to be waiting impatiently <laughs> for the report to come out. It's uh, fascinating and really good to see that you've been able to collect all this data on the experience and preparedness of countries. I'm going to um, take advantage of the fact that there's a few people who I happen to know who are, or who I know of uh, who are on the call and from other countries and who may be able to share some insights. Now, uh, I'll try not to put anybody on the spot unannounced, but I, I think we, we've I've just had a chat with Joel Mossong and, uh, from Luxembourg, and I understand you've got some new data coming out uh, from Luxembourg, and perhaps you could give us just a minute or two 
on the experience so far? Yeah, I've, um, I've, so we just had a, uh, a parliamentary investigation, Elisabetta from Italy was talking about it, that they're planning to do this in Italy, where we just had ours and, uh, and the report where I participated in as, a, as, as one of the experts, we had an international panel of experts, has just come out last week and, and uh, uh, was presented to parliament, to our parliament uh, uh, last Monday. Uh, it's been a kind, of, kind of a traumatic experience for myself. Uh, as you get, uh, of course, quite a lot, a lot of exposure to what are, in the end, political processes, uh, where it's not always easy to to be involved. So um, I'm, I think so. This report is is public. I'm just going to share the link to it. Um, also, for those who are interested, uh, uh, it's been a, a kind of a not a very scientific report. It's 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 trying to mix the uh, in a way the. Uh, is trying to make a report for 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 the for the members of parliament, which they can understand. So there there is some science in there, but not just science. It's also about uh, explaining some of the processes that that were involved. And uh, the major concern here in Luxembourg was whether everything was done to be able to prevent outbreaks, and and whether the measures that that were put in place by the government were sufficient uh, to to minimize uh, the deaths in, involved. So that is that was kind of a hard question to answer. And which will we, which we've, which we've tried to address in the report. Thank you very much, much appreciated. And I'm just going to do a quick opening up for uh, people who may want to have a quick word on other countries. I know we've got some people from uh, from Malta, Austria. I recognize a few names here. Um, anyone would like to just. Just unmute, you can speak directly. It's not too many of us, so we can handle this in a friendly way. <laughs> so I, th I see Aurora, Aurora has already um, unmuted. It is Maria Aurora Fenech from Malta. She's been a contributor to LTC COVID for a while. Aurora. I am. So I'm basically currently drawing an overview of, of the situation since COVID struck um, the, the residential care home. So currently the situation, um, from the data that I've been collating lately, um, older persons, there's a 99%, um, most of 99% of the older persons have been vaccinated. And those that haven't, um, mainly the reasons being that relatives did not give the consent for the older person to be vaccinated. Um, so I'm looking into that as well. I mean, even the fact that the older person did not get to consent himself or herself. As for staff members, I understand that the vaccination rate is around 98%. And mostly wow. those 2% are, are um, staff members who happened to be pregnant at the time that the vaccine was offered, or um, because they, they had a disposition of some underlying medical condition. But few of them, of these staff members, categorically refused to have the vaccine. Um, Currently, there is no obligation. I mean, the government doesn't oblige staff members to, to take the vaccine. And basically, it's the same as with the influenza vaccine. But, but it is, um, it, they're not pushed, but it is, they are um, enticed. Um, health promotion works a lot. So even, which, which, which in a way helps the current status of the long-term care care homes. So currently, 80% um, of the adult population in Malta has been vaccinated. Um, so, and now, um, these past two weeks, we've moved to vaccinating the 12 to 16 year olds. So in a way, this really helps the, the situation within, within the residential care settings. Um, something which helped, it's, it's a it's a double-edged sword, I must say, that care homes were under lockdown from the 15th March 2020 until the 14th June 2021. So even though older persons had been vaccinated since February of this year, they were only allowed out of the homes in June, mid-June. Currently, I understand that there are no positive cases, that there are positive cases of older persons, but 
few here and there and those are their patients who, who are being who are becoming positive they are being isolated in a part of the care home but there are i understand that there are no serious infections but we are experiencing malta the third wave so and we've been experiencing the third wave since two weeks and still the situation in care homes remains very much under control and let's hope it remains so so i'm working on on this currently Thank you very much for this update. And I don't want to put people on the spot without checking, but if anybody else would like to bring a contribution from a different country, different perspectives, please just unmute yourself and uh, or raise your hand, or, or you can even put the chat or a copy of uh, link to any reports on the chat. Um, so I, I've got a question that I'm going to, to bring around. So the, we've was very interesting to, to hear, I was thinking of the OECD presentation from Paula, all the different measures that countries have adopted to try to increase um, workforce during the pandemic. I don't know how much you've been able to get to the to how how effective these different measures were, and if there's any sense uh, of whether some of these measures worked better than others, and whether some of these may have some long-term implications and and learning that we can bring in. So, Paula, any thoughts on that? Sorry, I was struggling to unmute. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Um, that's a very interesting question. We, um, we, so for this project, we have performed uh, uh, policy and data questionnaires, and we have also had some interviews with country experts. And we have also tried to gather some information on how, how much these, uh, these measures are working. Um, it is a bit difficult uh, to, to get some, uh, some exact data on uh, how much the, this is working yet. Uh, but what I can say is that there have been some, uh, some measures that will have some uh, long-term effects. In particular, as I was mentioning, just to go a little bit into detail, there are some, uh, some uh, policies that aim at imp improving, increasing the number of workers. Um, so in not, not only recruiting new, new workers, but also recruiting students, recruiting um, a pool of, uh, creating a pool of uh, voluntary, um, voluntary people that could uh, help inside the uh, facilities. But also, for instance, there have been, uh, the creation, there's been the creation of uh, rapid response teams. So um, teams that were uh, uh, either workers, long-term care workers that were deployed to uh, facilities or geographic areas, they were more in need because they were um, they had some more serious outbreaks. Um, in these cases, I would say for for those measures that will um, that uh, regard uh, the recruitment of new employer or employees or uh, or recruitment of students, they are most likely going to to remain in the future. Of course, other measures like the rapid response teams will not. So it depends also uh, on the measure. For what concerns the other set of measures for the improvement of working uh, conditions, then there have been some one-time bonus. So they are not, they are one time, they are not going to be implemented further. But there have also been some uh, um, programs for the improve for the general improvement of workforce uh, conditions. And there have been also measures to improve, to increase the, the payments in a, in a permanent way. So permanent increase in the wage. So on the um, on the on the long term effects of uh, of this, we we can't say much, but we know that uh, this has triggered some reaction. And indeed, the title of my presentation was um, uh, uh, rising from uh, from the uh, okay. <laughs> it has been from a uh, uh, hurdles to the stars, meaning that from this period of uh, really difficult uh, moments for the long term care sector, we had we shed a spotlight, we shed a light on. The long-term care sector that will improve the sector further if we work further on this. So we are hoping that better, uh, better uh, performance will also come in the future thanks to these uh, measures. But thanks for your question. I wish I had more information on how it is already working now. Um, that's a very good follow-on. Then I think for another question that I'd like to pose of. Um, but our speakers from Portugal and from France, uh, Oscar and Leila. And um, thanks to my colleague, uh, Camille Ang, for a suggestion. So I would like to, to ask you, 
and if, if there's any thoughts both in Portugal and in France on adopting measures that may increase the recognition of uh, the social care workforce or the long-term care workforce that may help address some of the structural issues in this among this workforce. And perhaps we can go to France first, uh, Leila, if you're Yes, there have been several uh, measures and uh, some uh, money uh, was given to thanks the people who are working uh, by, uh, at home or in uh, nursing homes. Uh, and uh, there is a, a law which is uh, yeah, will be uh, present uh, this summer uh, by the government uh, to reform uh, nursing home uh, and to reform uh, the stay uh, at home. And uh, to, uh, for example, we think that we can have a house uh, or center uh, with uh, many workers uh, for uh, long-term care at home. And uh, in this uh, home, uh, these long-term care workers uh, can work together and uh, and, this, and discuss about their uh, people uh, with their taking care. So there is not just money, but also uh, organization. Thank you. And I'm going to follow up actually with another question. So I think in France, if I understand correctly, there's a pretty much a move towards compulsion of uh, vaccination in the care sector. Is that correct? And if so, is that seen as a threat towards people wanting to work in the sector? Uh, we hope that they, it won't be a threat. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, some, uh, some worker doesn't want to be vaccinated. And uh, there is uh, no uh, law to uh, force them to be uh, vaccinated, uh, whereas they won't be paid. So it's a very powerful law, and uh, some uh, nurse or uh, nursing home uh, worker uh, said they don't that. Uh, that doesn't want any more to work uh, in uh, nursing homes, but I don't know if it will be uh, effective. Yes, it's always very difficult to know which is the cause when you observe yeah. a change. <laughs> and, uh, yes, and uh, now going to bring that question to Oscar. Thank yeah, you, Oscar. sure. Um, that's a great question from Camille, actually. I just read uh, uh, the headline of a newspaper yesterday that all healthcare workers receive your claps, but we from the long-term care sector, we are uh, forgotten uh, yet again. Uh, and that really struck on me. And I, it made me think that, well, this is true. At least that's my experience and I perceive like that. Um, and that's why I'm very concerned in thinking about how do we shift the, the current debate. And of course, we still have to think about the pandemic. It's, it's not, done over yet uh in portugal we faced january march was very critical when we were facing our third wave and that's when uh, uh we had the most number of deaths uh, in in nursing homes here in portugal uh but at the same time we have to to have the debate and start having the debate and creating the the, the space in the society to to discuss towards how can we shift long-term care and, and into a learning ecosystem and actually have a societal debate of what we want as a society here in Portugal from long-term care? What is it? Um, what do we want? How do we see ourselves aging? Because we know all, all societies, they, they are all facing and just trying to discuss the aging uh, problem. Uh, but we have to be more active uh, towards uh, coming up with solutions that uh, receive the consensus uh, from, from society. Um, in regard to, to, to the vaccination, for example, uh, it's, it's, 
it's very difficult because we are talking about the liberty of oneself choosing to get the vaccine or not and to what extent it's their responsibility as a fellow citizen uh, towards getting vaccinations particularly knowing that that their workplace is very vulnerable uh, to an outbreak and we still have some outbreaks that we haven't uh, fully managed um, and we have around, from all staff, we have around 8,000 uh, uh, people that are not vaccinated and are working on a daily basis. Um, of course, if an outbreak is to, is to occur, you cannot attribute, well, it's because X and Y were not vaccinated, of course. But to what extent is our uh, civic duty to get ourselves vaccinated, uh, knowing that we are working with vulnerable people? Um, so there are a lot of debates happening uh, currently. Uh, we are all, uh, as societies, we are all tired uh, of discussing the pandemic and all the exercise with the pandemic. We are seeing uh, more and more often resistance to, to political measures towards controlling uh, um, uh, the, the pandemic. And But you know what? Uh, at the end of the day, um, we have to think ourselves that we are all human and it only makes sense uh, if we see ourselves in a society and not uh, only on our experiences, but we try to help to the best of our ability others. Thank you. That's uh, quite a thought. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oscar. And um, thanks both of you for your answers. I'm now going to invite uh, Simon Pottery to ask a question. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'd be um, really interested to hear about any differences between long-term care sectors in your countries, particularly the difference between nursing care and home care. Um, so in workforce terms, what we're seeing here in England um, is that, uh, that the vacancy rates for staff in nursing care are still below the levels that they were at before um, the pandemic, but that for home care, the rates have actually recently nudged above the rates they were at, so they've been increasing. Uh, and that's because uh, a lot of people obviously uh, don't want to go into care homes, don't want to go into nursing homes, and uh, home care has been picking up the, the slack in it and increasing. So I'd be really interested about any um, observations of that nature in your countries. Well, I can uh, jump in. <laughs> um, well, that's a problem that we are, we are facing as well in, in nursing homes uh, and home-based care in Portugal. Home-based, the, there, there, there are two perspectives here. One is we don't have the data to really know the impact uh, that we have on our workforce. So, uh, and the other is the government is aware that uh, we have a staff problem in, in nursing homes. We had it already before the pandemic and it's only got worse with the pandemic because as you said, Simon, uh, people are afraid to go to work, first of all. And um, it's very difficult to recruit people to those positions, especially when the pay is quite low. Um, the, the, the government set up a measure trying to streamline the recruitment process, trying to invite people so taxes are, are, are they are exempt of taxes for the period uh, that they are working uh, in, in nursing home facilities. But that's the problem. The, the, the policy is there, but people are not there. So <laughs> nursing home facilities, they, they, are, they are really finding difficult times to, to try to, to find candidates to fill those positions. Um, and the problem is no one really wants. And if people want to go to work in such a facility, they are either too young and, and unskilled and uh, are not really willing to, to uh, uh, see themselves in going more than one month or something like that. So we probably would rather invest in a, a volunteer program. Uh, and there are some nursing homes that they rely on that, but that's really a scarce number of, of nursing homes. So we are really have a huge problem in regard to, to staffing in nursing homes. And uh, if we go to Leila from France, and then we'll go, uh, maybe Paula, if you have a more international overview as well on this. So Leila? We also have uh, no data yet to see uh, the, to follow uh, the indicators of uh, staff missing or uh, 
or things like that. But I think we are uh, building the the data to do it. Uh, we will work with uh, what we call DSN. It is uh, the all employers uh, have to uh, to fulfill uh, this uh, questionnaire, and then uh, we will uh, have uh, the questionnaire uh, for long term for, for uh, nursing homes, and uh, we will be able to uh, follow before uh, the crisis and after the crisis to see if we if we uh, see a gap between uh, the uh, between the number of uh, workers. Thank you very much, and we look. Um, we, we will have to invite you back when you have some of that data, Leila. Thank you, and uh, Paola. Uh, do you have a sense from the international data, or the or the countries you've looked at? Well, I have to say, uh, our the sense we got with uh, our analysis also over the year is a uh, very in line, very much in line with what Oscar already mentioned. Uh, there is a serious issue of high turnover. So, as you were mentioning. If young people um, do the job, they are not particularly skilled and they don't get paid enough, then the high turnover will, uh, will not be solved easily. Um, so yeah, I really, for what I've seen, I, I can say, of course, there is country variation on this, but uh, overall, it is really, really in line with what Oscar already, already mentioned. Um, yeah, so I don't have more specific data, but again, you can find uh, more information in the link I sent, but definitely, definitely, I follow uh, Oscar response very closely. And um, now I'm going to invite Ricarda Milstein to ask a question. And I think I'm going to invite two different people to answer it this time. I'm going to first ask Paola, but then we'll go to Stefania Elinka, who I see is also active in the chat. So Ricarda. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Adelina, and thank you very much to all presenters and the audience for this very interesting debate. And when Paula shared her, uh, uh, the experience of other countries with regards to the workforce, um, I couldn't help but notice that we have a very similar discussion in the inpatient sector and the long-term care sector with both sectors noticing severe nursing shortages. Um, when we look at political debates, I often have the impression that the inpatient sector is more successful in receiving political attention in realizing higher salaries, thus attracting a nursing workforce that would actually have been more necessary perhaps for the long-term care sector that is then attracted by the inpatient sector. And I was wondering whether any of the countries uh, or any of you are aware of a joint coordinated approach to ensure that nurses um, are welcomed in the sector where they are probably most needed. Thank you. Okay, I go ahead. <laughs> yes. I already, as I already, so thanks a lot for your question. It's truly interesting, very interesting point. I had already uh, answered in the chat. Uh, our project has really focused on the long-term care sector, and we didn't come uh, like we didn't um, find any joint uh, um, initiative yet. But it will definitely be something we could uh, look more into. It will be super interesting. Um, and yeah, I would say that from uh, how the things are going for the moment, countries tend to have a big issue with, uh, with care coordination uh, at any level. So I believe a joint, uh, a joint intervention on this will be a little bit challenging in this moment, uh, but definitely something to aim at. So definitely an interesting point raised, but really thanks a lot for this. And um, now going to invite for the final comment, uh, Stefania Linka, who uh, I think you have a perspective from Romania. Yeah, I'll and, be very quick, yeah. but uh, the, the question in the chat reminded me of the situation that Romania is going through and I'm sure other Southern European and Eastern European countries. And, and I should say this predates the pandemic by quite a bit. Uh, but there have been quite a bit of uh, quite a few reforms uh, in these countries uh, to increase working conditions and improve remuneration in the healthcare sector. 
in an effort to stop the emigration of healthcare personnel, uh, which is indeed a priority and should be a priority, uh, but it's been done in such a way uh, in complete abstraction of the situation in long-term care, uh, and ended up being an improvement for healthcare providers, especially public healthcare providers, um, but an absolutely destructive reform for long-term care, which now has to contend with competition internally, and they're particularly losing nurses, um, and, and also externally, because we're also hemorrhaging long-term care workers um, to, to other European countries. So um, I, I understand that it's, it's very difficult for researchers to um, take an integrated approach, but I think it's absolutely essential for policymakers to do this. Uh, workforce is just one example, and I'm, I, I'd go one step further. I don't want to be too long in the chat. I think there's a need for a European coordinated approach. Uh, any one country, especially sending countries in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, cannot on their own, um, you know, really put, a, put up a fight. Uh, and, and it really takes a much broader and integrated approach. And I hope we can all advocate for that in our own work in any way we can. Thank you. It was a fascinating seminar. All the talks were brilliant. Thank you very much. And I completely agree uh, that this was a fascinating webinar indeed. I'm delighted that all of you were able to present. We're now going to take a break uh, for August and uh, we're going to be back in September. We've already got a couple of uh, dates aligned, so I'll be sharing the the, pro the early emerging program very soon. Uh, we're going to put uh, the video recording of this webinar and also the slides on the LTC COVID webpage in about a week from now. So thank you very much. I hope you have, uh, you're in Europe, a good summer. Uh, it's not too hot <laughs> and not too rainy and all that. And uh, very best wishes, hoping that the vaccines keep working and we, and, uh, we can make all this work. Thank you and uh, see you soon. Bye. <laughs>